Krishnan, and I'm the Associate Vice President for the IDC Industrials team uh, with IDC Insights. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, this morning, we're talking about introducing AI and logistics, and I, we've had a great session with uh, Corber before um, talking about the, the use of logistics, uh, sorry, the use of AI in a logistics environment. Um, we had some great examples about, uh, you know, I, I love the idea of, of being, you know, uh, hands-free, but also I think I heard the word legs-free, which I think was very interesting where they were talking about, you know, robotics, um, you know, basically enabling workers. Um, we're hearing a lot about logistics and the use of AI, both from a um, capabilities perspective, but also from a data point of view where organizations are starting to, to understand that they can actually get more out of their data and use AI um, to analyze historical data, but also analyze data in real time, um, looking at some of the use cases that are enabling things like real time decision agility so that, you know, should something happen, uh, AI and machine learning can do things like detect anomalies um, and, and then enable real time decision making that allows for rebooking of flights or, or dealing with congestion in certain areas. So today we're going to explore this. We're going to look at, you know, what exactly is it? Uh, you know, why would we use it and, and how would it be used? So joining me today are, are my panelists. Um, I have Milin, who's the co-founder and CEO of uh, Logi AI. Um, I have Anandan Sundara Raman, head of business solutions, uh, logistics and supply chain for Goodpack. Also joining me is Kamish Mirza, head of supply chain management, Asia Pacific for Eric, Ericsson Telecommunications. Uh, and also Anders Nordal, COO, Asia Pacific for Mixmove. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Now, um, we'll just jump right in. Um, today, we have a goal of understanding what AI can do for logistics and supply chain roles and organizations um, and try and leave people at least with an understanding of what is possible or even better, an idea of how to use it um, and even first steps to take. So let's dive with, right in. And, you know, what is AI and what is the difference between AI and ML? And perhaps, Kamish, you could get us started on this. Sure. Uh, thanks, Tiffany. Uh, well, uh, I, I kind of started with a very layman's concept here, uh, and I compare this entire uh, concept with a Russian nesting uh, doll, uh, where each of these concepts is a subset of each other. So I think we start uh, the very fundamental thing. So we start with artificial intelligence, which is basically the umbrella discipline, which covers everything related to making machines smarter. I mean, it's a concept of creating smart, intelligent machines. Then uh, the subset of uh, um, AI is ML, which is machine learning, popularly referred to as. Now, this is an AI system which can self-learn based on algorithms, which the systems can get smarter and smarter without human intervention. And then, of course, deep learning, which is a, another subset of machine learning, which is about computers learning to think using structures modeled on the human brains. So deep learning then can analyze images, videos, and unstructured data in the way machine learning can't do. So it's a little bit of a, you know, uh, the analogy which I used in the beginning, uh, the Russian nesting doll, where each of these concepts is uh, a subset of, of that. Of course, as we said, uh, AI is uh, the umbrella discipline covering probably everything to make the machine smarter. Yeah. Great, thanks for that, Kamesh. Uh, Sandra, did you have something to add to that? Sure, mm, okay. Kamesh, very nicely covered in technology side. Since it's a logistics supply chain forum, let's use some logistics terminology to understand. It's not exactly apple to apple comparison, but just to relate, I can give my view. Uh, if you think AI and the ML is a mostly, I mean, confused wording in the uh, industry due to the, um, difficult to differentiate i will tell you like this ai is something like our 3pl outsourcing you are finding a partner i want outsourcing outsourcing could be transportation warehousing value added services it could be anything whatever you don't want to do and you expect you want from outside uh, that's the way i can define ai it's something like third party logistics completely outsourcing service to somebody and uh, ml Specifically on the transportation, how you want to manage your transportation. That could be, you can classify as a YAML. And uh, again, it's not a perfect comparison, but if you go deep learning in the transportation, you go air, land, ocean, which mode you want to be specific. 
which will make you better how to optimize it further when you do mixed mode or single mode etc so that's the way we can call subsets of this thing just to relate uh, how this ai ml and the deep learnings are differentiated just for the layman terminology again it's not a 100% perfect comparison but you get the feel that ai is a bigger umbrella and machine learning is a subset further down is a deep learning just maybe if you take away from for you in this session okay great thanks for that and i think it is good re to relate it to something that we're all familiar with so i appreciate that um but i think we do get the idea that al is just like a broad umbrella term um and there are subsets of that now idc's recent future of operations survey determined that 85% of Asia Pacific logistics and transportation providers consider artificial intelligence or machine learning important or even critical in terms of their ability to help organizations achieve operational excellence and resilience. Now, on the other hand, um, you know, so, so we've got on one hand, we've got uh, organizations considering it to be, you know, critical or very important. But on the other hand, only half of those are actually prioritizing investment in AI or machine learning over the next five years. So, does this align with what you gentlemen are seeing in the market? And, you know, why do you think this is the case? You know, Milan, perhaps if you could open us up here. Thank you, Stephanie. So what uh, you just mentioned is something that I see every day uh, in my customer conversation. And uh, there are three main things that I have noticed, uh, three main reasons for this. One is uh, leaders usually do not understand uh, where to start, how the technology works, where it will break, what are the possibilities. Second uh, stumbling block that I see for organizations for not being able to start is data infrastructure. Yeah? Even when they start the conversation, somebody comes and says, yeah, you don't have data. Yeah, your data is not good enough. And third reason and this, uh, this comes up in almost every conversation, the bad publicity around AI, that AI will take away jobs. Yeah. And uh, I don't know why that third part is relevant, but uh, uh, and I, we will discuss this probably uh, more in detail during the panel. But together, all these three points lead to a so, sort of a ambivalence uh, on the decision making at the leadership level. And this, uh, this is what I see every day uh, with our customers. So if we're seeing this lack of understanding, this lack of data infrastructure, and, and this, this, I guess, yeah, like you said, concerns over whether AI is actually going to take our jobs, and this is leading to, leading to hesitancy about adoption. Correct. Great, yeah. Um, does anybody else have any, any thoughts on that? Sundar, perhaps? Sure. Um, just to continue, Melan mentioned he's from the service provider side, let me talk from the consumer side where I actually use the AI. Uh, my, my view in this aspect is like you mentioned, um, the management to understand that. I think today world know we are living in a very fast paced world. We everybody agree that in the olden days concept, uh, the bigger organization, I mean, bigger fish catch the small fish. Now this situation change, the faster fish catch the slower fish. People expect that everything to be perfect, every possible things can be answered, then only we start the project, which is not going to happen anymore. If somebody wants for all the, all the possible scenario to be discussed and have a solution for that before even we start this project, it takes ages by the time the new technology may be arrived. I think that's the biggest challenge we have. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a better way to put it, like, um, what is the expectation for the system? You need a holistic system. You try to address a macro level problem. Don't try to create some foolproof or idiot proof system which is not going to happen and today well everybody need to be a computer literacy and uh, we expected that people have need to play artificially doesn't mean we take away our intelligence our intelligence still needed so that's where the expectation mismanagement happening people are afraid to even try once they decide to invest they go with a lot of permutation combination what happened this what happened this what if scenario is good to have but if you're only talking about for a few years you you will be already losing the boat uh, that's my observation why it's it, your your question uh, relevance to this yeah yeah great thank you um kamish did you have anything to add to that yeah i think i quite agree with a few comments but but the the another another aspect of uh, when when organizations are trying to drive digital transformation is the approach uh, or the mindset in which they drive i think that's very important right which is uh, uh, 
it is not for me it's not a standard plain vanilla operational efficiency topic which is traditionally what the organization will look at for when you drive an ai or ml use case this is a little bit more pragmatic uh, kind of a thing which will basically transform and many a times change the way of looking at things so many times uh, we feel that when you put the uh, the old template of uh, you know getting the impact or value realization of ai then we have a problem because uh, generally what we have seen with our experience is that the return on investment uh, for these kind of use cases you, you, there are different uh, so to say uh, the the periods are a little bit longer than uh, when you when you when you are driving a standard process automation or a or a or a or operation excellence as we say so it it is a little bit uh, if you look at an evolution side versus a revolutionary side or a transformation side the approach will have to be different and many a times uh, we feel that uh, organization do make a mistake but of course uh, the beauty of this uh, stephanie is also that uh, uh, you need to also have the appetite to fail because we are trying out something so you need to also understand that this is something which will will come with uh, with sudden risk you need to try out a few things you can't get first time right because nobody has got this first time right in any which way so there has to be an organizational culture uh, which basically says yeah go ahead and take that risk we are we have that appetite so it's very important so it comes from the top the the appetite of taking risk the approach wherein we take a, a more pragmatic approach more transformational approach Okay, yeah, that's a good point. I think that was a, a point that was actually uh, brought up in Logisim yesterday, which you know, that having that appetite for failure, but there are ways to control that. Which brings me to Anders. Um, do you have any thoughts about you know uh, why organisations are hesitancy hesitating and and how we can perhaps uh, uh, remove that hesitancy? Well, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, I, I always take a very practical uh, view to transformation and how how deployment of technology can actually help an organisation. I think the one of the hesitancies that we we've seen, and I've been working in this for decades already, and looking at challenges of changing work processes and so on. The argument is a little bit: is system in 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 play today ready to take on this challenge of working with these kind of of tools? Uh, and and I think if you if you try to do a sandbox environment as is today, identifying the opportunities and then identifying how you can actually deploy this in existing architectural uh, designs and and business architectures. I think you have an opportunity to really uh, scale uh, the, the adoption on on, on 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 machine learning as a starting point, and then move on to artificial intelligence later on, and of course later on, uh, and deep learning, which I will talk about in a, in a little bit later on today. So, Anders, um, just just to deep dive a little bit that for people that might not be familiar with the term, what exactly is a sandbox? So sandbox is where you you are running um, uh, uh, almost like a twin of what you're currently operating with. So you can essentially take the data set, you can uh, you can you can simulate side by side with your existing uh, operational environment, and you can do what if scenarios in that sandbox environment, which allows you to to test out your your hypothesis or what you intend to do, and then prove a use case using that kind of environment. Yeah, so it's it's not in effect. It's it's isolated from the real world environment. It's allowing you to right. simulate on on existing data, real data, um, using the parameters that are in your existing system without necessarily, you know, if something does go wrong, then it, it's not going to have implications in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, l large organization they essentially have a copy of the operating operation operational ecosystem in a separate uh, a separate instance, and in in certain cases you can actually use that also as a sandbox, so that you don't impede on today day to day operations, but you can actually test it out in a in a fairly live environment if you if you want to use that word. Yeah, and I think uh, small organizations can take the opportunity by extracting data sets, you know, and then playing with those in in. You know, separate separate environments as well. So I think there's opportunities for both large and small to do that. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, um, all right. So that takes us to you know we've we've mentioned a little bit about getting efficiencies, etc. Um, so exactly where can AI or machine learning be used? I mean, we heard a little bit about the panel um, earlier where they were looking at it from a, a you know a hands free perspective and being you know having it support some of the the capabilities that are in physical warehouse movements. Um, I mentioned briefly about anomaly detection. I've, I've seen it used in yield opti optimization. Perhaps, um, Milind, you could take us through some, some you know, use cases that you've seen it, you know, actually yield practical results. Sure. Thank you, Stephanie. 
So uh, for logistics industry in particular, uh, where we have a process and transaction related uh, approach, and that is how we also quite often treat our data. I see real quick wins if we uh, focus on AI implementation on tasks. Uh, to give you an example, uh, our salespeople, for example, in let's say freight forwarding, uh, really loves to make minutes uh, and put it in the CRM. This can de- yeah, this can be done by an AI. Yeah, similarly, uh, uh, for finance departments. Uh, they receive a lot of documents which have to be entered into the system. Data entry is a very interesting and good use case. Uh, customs declaration documents, HS code classifications, and and many, many more. As long as we... And there are existing solutions now available which are state-of-the-art and are uh, and have been measured to be better at humans, uh, than humans, slightly better, and keep learning. So this is where... Uh, uh, this is where the opportunities are in logistics space, where quick wins can be had. Uh, three months, six months, and you can really see the results uh, immediately. A few, a couple of things to uh, remember about uh, these uh, about these use cases is that they are they can be started off with the data that you already have, yeah, and you can show uh, and prove the worth in a very short period of time. So. Yeah. So with those sort of systems, I mean, you know, you've talked about the use cases, but the systems behind that, you are looking at things like, you know, almost like a virtual employee. Uh, and, and and there is a lot of work being done with that. I think most of us have dealt with chatbots on the side, but it's a little bit deeper than that, right? Yes. Uh, and these are all specialized task bot AI, uh, task focused AI. And one thing, uh, they usually work with humans. Mm -hmm. So it is not that you are going to replace the humans. What you are going to do is take your best employee and make all your employees equally good. Yeah, understood. And so we are seeing, you know, you you talked about some of the task-based stuff with data entry. Um, You know, we're seeing great stuff with RPA and and IPA, which is intelligent process automation. Um, You know, and that's, that's definitely one area where we're seeing the uh, swivel swivel chair WMS, which was a, a term I learned recently, where we're having, uh, you know, somebody entering here and then somebody entering over here and, and somehow coordinating the two systems together, which is, is you know, one way of doing it. But I think we can, you know, be smarter with that. And we are seeing uh, intelligent uh, recognition of tasks that can be automated, which is fantastic. Um, anyone else have some examples that they would like to throw up? Uh, I can make a, make a, an exa- example. So what we do at Big Smooth, we uh, our product is focused around cross stock operations, and primarily then looking at front of the house or warehouse and WMS environments. And what we have been doing, I mean, we do we've been doing, working on this now for almost seven years. Uh, is, is really about building a rule based capability. That's what we have been built up, and now we're working on, on uh, adopting ML in understanding on what are the the, the things that an operator will do to make the changes. And then once we have that ecosystem in there, then the AI will actually take over that operator to identify all the tweaking in the system. Um, and that's actually something which is really, really feasible. And we have literally millions of decisions being uh, being done and being built up. And, and I think the ability to have AI to then figure out what would be the next scenario based on past performance is something that we are really close to having live uh, as we speak. Yeah. So, so to give an example in terms of rules based, it would be you know if a something is flagged as a, a priority, then it would go through one process. Or, um, and, but but however, you're starting to see that yeah. based on past performance, you're actually able to to preempt that and have the system flag it as a priority. Would that be an example? Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I mean, we are, we are, we are. I would say, with our capabilities, with our technology, we are at, at about ninety percent near autonomous operations already. Okay, which is which is you know fantastic because it does take a lot of that that manual processing out of that and allows organ allows people to focus on their their you know problem solving capabilities, which is actually what people are better at. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, people are much better at do, at, at working on edge cases that are a, a normal a and and what have you. Uh, it can be anything related to flooding, can be in those kind of things where the machine not, may not realize oh, why, all of a sudden, why do I have this scenario happening? So sometimes you need to be careful that you don't run 
at 100% automatic because there's just too many variables in in our ecosystem today that that uh, it's going to be quite risky if you if you let it loose all the way. Yeah, thank you. And Kamesh, you've you've had uh, some you've been using some use cases with regards to quality and and asset performance. Perhaps you could share on that. Yeah, I think, I think uh, we are uh, obviously uh, doing a lot of use cases. Uh, if you look at in different process areas, you talk about uh, the make process where we have the incoming quality. We have use cases in the uh, our smart factory <clears throat> where we are trying to kind of create artificial intelligence where we connect with all our suppliers to to make sure that we have enough uh, you know uh, efficiency and productivity gains through this technology asset performance. Uh, in the area of the plan, we have uh, demand sensing. And I think this is where I think we've we've been um, getting some very interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, experiences uh, where we put machine learning algorithms to uh, to help us to predict our demand. So we kind of also have the traditional SNOP process where we we kind of uh, you know um, you know, aggregate the demand and then. We are comparing now with machine learning uh, algorithms, uh, based, which which is able to learn, and we have been uh, you know uh, testing that uh, for the last uh, um, a year now, and we see some <clears throat> uh, great improvements and great so to say insights coming from uh, that uh, use cases, which basically helps us to take uh, much more informed decisions. So something which is very interesting, uh, which we are going through. Uh, it is still, I would say, um, under under process. We, we we I can't say that we kind of ticked off everything because demand forecasting is a very complex process, as everyone is aware of, uh, and every industry has its own set of issues, uh, you know, which they need to keep in mind. So, but but I think something which uh, we have been trying to use, uh, uh, and then of course we also uh, are trying to do some use cases in the area of. Uh, uh, um, supplier risk assessment, digital twin. So yeah, we have a handful actually uh, of, of use cases where we we kind of trying uh, trying out many many things uh, in this area. And uh, and uh, like I mentioned to you you guys in the beginning, you need to have a little bit more time to get get the impact or the value realization on the table. You can't just expect results very quickly. Yeah. And I think that's an important consideration because it's not that you're going to go into these and then have, you know, 100 percent accuracy or, you know, the ability to predict predict demand to, you know, 100 percent. But if you're able to even get like a, a five or a 10 percent incremental improvement with some, you know, some of the models that you're impl implementing and then you're able to fine tune that. So you are actually able to get better results in the long term. I think, you know, that's the mindset that we should be approaching this with. Yes. Yeah. The other thing is also. Uh this is not a this is not a technology uh, you know deployment exercise you know generally people confuse that as as somebody said it's, this is not a erp deployment this is not a you know you, you're not just doing uh, you know deploying a a tool kit you're kind of uh, doing a lot of transformation associated with that so it's 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 a little complex uh, you know in terms of how we uh, do the adoption cycle so to your point and as we said there is a sandbox where we test the cases but when you when you say, okay, now this is good to go, then you typically, I mean, it depends on the scale of the organization and also the way uh, the approach is taken by every organization. But traditionally, the, the approach, which basically is considered to be the best of, uh, you know, effort is, uh, best of, uh, approach is you do the, uh, the, the, the sandbox testing and then, and then the line organization will try and accelerate the adoption in each of their market areas. And that I think it makes makes the chain management e easier, and and generally uh, there will be a team of uh, digital experts or experts who are so called the technology guys who kind of create this entire monster or, or engine. But the line organization or the people who run the business should be the one who should own this, because many a times when you try and do the other way around, you fail. Because the line organization, which is running the supply chain practice for a particular market area or a particular function, should own digital transformation. The the teams, the, the the sandbox team or whatever we just spoke about, are the teams. We their role will be to enable it, and that is a very important aspect when you try and do these use cases. Otherwise, you might just go completely wrong. So you think we're having a shifting role of of you know IT or technology departments in in understanding this and in the way that they're approaching this. They're becoming more enablers are more involved in the line of business. So we're starting to see that partnership. 
absolutely absolutely uh, there is no choice we have to do that yeah yeah great thank you very much now we've talked about some of the use cases i just want to pivot slightly and, and come to some of the challenges that are associated with this a lot obviously we've talked about you know there, there can be um issues i you know I, I have conversations with users and they talk about oh we want to implement ai like it's some black box that i'm going to install into the organization and while it works right so I, I don't think that's a realistic expectation but i think there's also other challenges that we need to be mindful of um, perhaps, uh, Anders, if you could start, you know, what, what have you experienced? Look, I think the 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 the, the, the challenge is is, uh, is really down to to the, the data quality. How what kind of data do you have? How is the data structured in your operations? Uh, and and how much have you adopted um, a, a, a digital environment altogether as an organization? Uh, we pioneered together with GS One something we call Scan for Transport Labels which is posted directly on the digital twin, enabling any system to pick up the data, being able to learn and, 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 and contribute to how the movement of goods happens. Uh, so, so those are the things that, that I think is, is important when you, when you look at trans, transitioning and transforming into uh, a, um, a digital ready and a digital native environment. It's really about understanding the full end-to-end -end of, your, of, of your operating environment. All right, true. That's very true. Getting your data right is, is certainly key. Um, you know, Sunda, do you have anything that you wanted to add to the challenges? Yeah, sure. So first item, I mean, the continuity of earlier question also is um, who driving, who leading this solution is very important. That's the important mindset I noticed so far. If you're expecting that IT or some uh, external party going to implement AI, I would say probability of failure is very high because we need to have that mindset that this project is going to be led by the business community. It's like the system integrator or IT company and also your internal IT team building the car, the super efficient car for you with the various function, engine, etc. The person to drive the car is a business community. If that's not happen, you may not know the integrity, some of the data challenges, then if you don't appreciate why it's failing, all of them will be the problem. That's the reason I always, even my company in organization, I never agree IT leading this project. I know they're the main brain behind doing all these things, but still they're building the car. They're not driving the car. We are the one driving the car. So that's my mindset. I would say that uh, we need really need it. Otherwise, the probability of success will be less. Second item is like a, earlier our panel mentioned that the ROI time is very long. In my project, I'm currently working on that is five years. Imagine how difficult to convince somebody for ROI five years. It's not going to be easy. Uh, again, sometimes people too excited. Why my case went five years also? I initially proposed one site. They said, no, we are doing one site, mean we do 12 sites, okay? Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> But 12 sites may need a more longer investment, and of course, you need a more ROI time period. So we went from zero to 100, something like that, suddenly. So, but I've seen most of the time the ROI two years to five years depends on how big your size. And as mentioned by some of the panelists, some of the quick wins are there, but people don't appreciate this real quick win. Oh, is it really AI so simple? I mean, <laughs> that also sometimes the mindset, hey, it doesn't mean AI, I mean, too complicated, like series and Terminator movies. All these things is not AI. AI could be as simple as that your data entry also can optimize it. Also could be AI. It's again, that kind of mindset require, I would say that. Yeah, this is my experience about this challenge. Yeah, I want to come back to the, the businesses driving the, the car, but Milan, you're, you're laughing at the, the last point. You know, do you have something to add there? <laughs> no, just thinking about the image of Terminator running out of batteries. But... <laughs> <laughs> but... Right. Yeah, yeah, to go on with some of the challenges, though, perhaps you could jump in. Yeah, uh, in fact, one of the key challenges, uh, this is something that uh, uh, most of the panelists uh, hinted about, uh, also Kamish uh, mentioned this. Uh, one of the key challenges that I notice is that AI uh, requires a different kind of mindset because the product develop. it's not uh, uh, like an ERP that you, uh, or, or any other software that you install, you custom, you make changes to the settings and boom, it's working. It's a learning thing and it is a, a deployment uh, in your organization is much more of an R&D, uh, an experimentation thing. So, and 
what you can experiment with depends on what data you have and how your uh, how good a data engineering data science team is, that you have which te- plays around with it so this mindset uh, of uh, of experimentation in it tool deployment is something quite new and this is where i th- i think one of the challenges is from the expect management expectation point of view this is something that is not clear from them it means process software deploy done that doesn't work with ai yeah you have to think about it in a slightly different manner exactly yeah no, and and i'm just going to come back cuz it seems to be a point that's been raised up you know we've got you know it that that idea that it is a you know deploy upgrade test you know production environments you know etc et um but then we've got the line of business that's driving the bus or driving the car as 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 sunda said so you know uh we've actually got a comment from uh, andy seat who's talking about you know the ownership and adoption should be driven by the business operations and users and not entirely driven by it or digital consultants so you know coming back to that idea of mindset are we seeing that mindset and 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 again i'm kind of linking this back to the previous uh session where there was a question saying you know uh we're saying that there's a worker shortage and that we don't have the uh, the capability is is it is it a digital worker shortage and a shortage of people that have this mindset that that we're actually talking about here you know where where is you know are there challenges here in in terms of having line of business people that are capable of driving that car i mean if i take that question stevani yeah. uh, if you may have if if you if you talk about digital transformation which is the the, the buzzword in the organization and uh, and say who would like to be a part of digital transformation everybody say yeah yeah this is a nice and easy. you know everybody say yeah we want to get up, get into this digital transformation but nobody knows how to do it right uh, the a simple way a simple approach which could work is or or works most of the time as as we just you know, I'll probably allude to what what we just spoke about is the business owns the digital transformation so if a demand manager i'm just using an example case in point of a particular organization he said okay mr demand manager you own the digital transformation of that unit and that process right and if you have to be a little bit more regimented then you put certain okrs right which shows whether the needle is moving so and the ownership of the of the okrs is with the demand manager so the demand manager of that particular process or the unit owns the okrs for digitalization so in that sense you empower that person say that you are the one who is driving digital transformation for this particular side of thing so which is great and that's where the ownership and accountability comes in stephen right and then the, and the office which as we said a couple of guys said it's basically the tools guys or the or the people who are in the sandbox kind creating this solutions are the one who will probably create smart solutions to uh, you know uh, to give it to this demand guy to say okay mr demand guy this is the solution you've got can you accelerate that option and adoption does not mean just picking up one thing and just pasting it there it does not happen like this there is a lot of you know uh, you know uh, customization needs to be done there is a lot of to and fro communication which happens from the r&d team back to the line team. and this is an iterative process and you have to have a room or a culture or a or a governance to have that otherwise you as we said in a couple of uh, minutes ago this is not a tool deployment this is a transformation we are trying to do so that's basically the ownership part so the, the line takes the ownership the uh, and the and the technology guys enable it i think that is very uh, very very uh, you know clear and of course you need to also have bear in mind that there has to be a very uh, structured review mechanisms because we don't know what we don't know in the beginning so that also is very important when you do this we don't know what we don't know so we need to also have that mindset and it's okay to fail so probably take a six month approach take the stock of the situation and then we say okay this was not so nice we go take i think that's the kind of culture more of an agile mindset will only work you keep a, a traditional mindset uh, very difficult that's my learning yeah mm-hmm. and i i think that's an important thing because you, are, you you do almost have to embrace a culture of uncertainty in in that regard um which which brings me to my next point when we're looking at um uh, uncertainty i mean covid-19 has kind of been the the mother of all uncertainties right so uh, from that perspective are we looking at um you know a, a, if you like almost a, a a an event that has kind of given us a kick up the um a kick in the right direction let's say uh with regards to um 
you know, uncertainty. Has COVID enabled that uncertainty that makes us a little bit more comfortable with taking risk at the moment? And does it, has it, you know, impacted the way that logistics or supply chain views AI and some of the uncertainty around deployment around that? Uh, perhaps Anders, if you could start us there. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, we we have been quite quite fortunate in the way that we designed uh, our product line in the sense that typical supply chain today are operated in in a linear way, meaning you plan to start and then you plan the end as a as a single process, and then you hand it over to another person to take the next leg. Um, what we have pioneered is really how to adopt synchromodality. That means. The one who starts a process is not necessarily the one that's going to be the handover point until it reached the last point. And this is a specific use case where you can really realize very quickly that machine learning and AI becomes incredibly critical in doing that. And we had the benefit with one of our big customers to, in preparation for Brexit, already plan on what do we need to do to ensure that the Brexit situation, because we didn't know if it's going to happen, we didn't know what's going to be the impact. And, and, and whilst uh, the customer had big operations in Ireland, the normal route to Ireland was through the UK. But all of a sudden, now UK is no longer Euro European Union. So they had to find a way how to, to bypass that. And we built uh, a few tweaks to, to, to that system and how that operation was, was done. So when Brexit came, sorry, uh, when uh, COVID came, um, it literally took them five hours to reconfigure the entire operations in Europe just because of that level of pre preparedness. Uh, but and I think the the abilities for organizations to admit that gray swan events and black swan events are happening, and how do you prepare for them? How do you prepare for floods, fires, uh, um, not singular incidents but multiple incidents? Um, I think those are key elements. And again, coming back to what we talked about before, uh, a digital twin capable uh, operations means that you become incredibly resilient. If one facility have to shut down, all of a sudden you have to move the business over to another facility. You might have to use the vehicle as a warehouse. You know, how is your technology adopting to that? And, and we've been incredibly fortunate to, to have had the foresights to, to really prepare that. And, and I can ha honestly say our customers haven't had any impacts uh, uh, than, that didn't, you know, it didn't stop the movement of goods. That, that, that's encouraging. Um, Kamish, mm. are you seeing a similar thing with, uh, in terms of the impact that COVID-19 has had on the way that logistics uses AI? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we, we've started our digital transformation journey much before COVID happened. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, we realized during COVID, uh, and we, everybody realized how how, how, uh, yeah, how how situation changed. And uh, then supply chain resilience become becoming the name of the game as far as, you know, our, our supply chain practices are concerned. Geopolitics became extremely relevant. And so the entire input variables, when we look at the... Uh, uh, building uh, an AI model changed, so so I think uh, this this obviously uh, I mean there are good good reasons and bad reasons. There are advantages, uh, of course. What happened within most of the organizations accelerated that digitalization because they thought that's the only way they could, you know, uh, you know, get this uh, get out of uh, uh, this particular and make their make themselves much more stronger. But what happened uh, uh, is. Uh, the complete rules of the game changed actually and uh, what we we feel that uh, so traditionally we look at a supply chain where you know uh, the supply supply capabilities every any organizations are generally ahead of the demand right because that's where we we get the the, the supply chain uh, design guys who say okay you design a supply chain which is always able to handle the the overall demand and but now it will and that's a traditional way but the situation will change now with, with this whole uh, you know, uh, pandemic impact and 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 the and the impact of resilience and geopolitics and all, the the entire model will will be the other way around, where we have to adjust ourselves to the new realities, where we'll always be doing a catch up with uh, uh, with our demand and supply capability will always be kind of trying to you know just just get closer. Concepts like GIT will no longer uh, are no longer relevant anymore for some of the industries we, we know that so i think a lot of things are happening uh, a lot of things uh, uh, we have learned in the last couple of years uh, which also has led to adjustments on of, of our digital transformation strategy but uh, i would say nine out of ten times uh, uh, the general comments we're getting is let's accelerate this 
because that's where where the organizations and leaders feel that this will help them to achieve uh, uh, you know uh, and help them to bail out in this current situation that's basically the thinking as we speak yeah so I, i'm hearing that too i'm hearing that uh, and we saw this in our research that those that were, had already started on their digital transformation journeys or were implementing digital capabilities were faring much better from profit and performance perspective compared to their non-digital counterparts um and I, I think that is allowing you know organizations to pivot or to you know adapt tools that they've invested in uh, and i think that is an important thing is is you know when we do a adopt these tools and implement them it's not a one for one you know one tool for one use case it's looking at how we're going to scale that and i think ai is is certainly a a, a generic term or a generic capability that can be scaled across multiple use cases once you start that journey so uh, and and i think covid certainly highlighted that for a lot of organizations now with that you know i've talked about bringing in tools and we've talked about disruption um you know, in, in terms of integration, how important is integration um, as part of enabling AI? You know, what are the source of data? You know, is it a source of data? Is it um, somewhere where we you know, feed results into? You know, how does that work? So, Stephanie, uh, may I jump in here? Certainly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, from, uh, from an AI perspective for logistics and supply chain companies, there are uh, the, for uh, for AI tools and their deployment, the the challenge that I see is not so much in the integration. There are, uh, in fact, AI tools now for integration uh, from different data sources. They will read your data, map uh, map it out, and uh, and there are out of the box tools uh, and databases now around this. The key challenge that I see, and this is why I was, uh, 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 this is why I advise uh, companies on the on the uh, on deploying tools for their uh, line staff, because that is where data is getting captured, and usually the quality of data issue that we face, especially in uh, logistics, uh, more uh, much more in freight forwarding let's say in large uh, uh, large uh, organizations uh, supply chain departments or other large organizations but that is where we have to address the issue of data quality so give an example when uh, an ai is reading an invoice or a packing list and entering the data it is not cutting corners uh, the entire information is always getting captured and this is the true building block for a bigger AI infrastructure across the organization. Because unless we get this basics of, uh, uh, of the information and information flow, where first we should be able to capture the entire data and then build data pipelines across. Uh, so, uh, otherwise, uh, creating data lakes, et cetera, with data, poor data quality, doesn't work for the long term so i don't see uh, integration that uh, as that big a challenge than uh, focus on capturing and maintaining data quality yeah and I, I think we're seeing a strong argument for having you know greater mobility uh, or access to mobile devices on the floor to enable that um, looking at you know scaling the capabilities into those devices or, or looking at integrating I, IoT. So really looking at your technology stack is what I'm hearing um, when it comes to, to capturing those data and making sure that you're able to pull that on. Now, um, I'll just uh, go into something which has kind of been the, I guess, the elephant in the room around all this is, is if we're doing this, aren't we making humans redundant? Like, aren't we getting rid of the people in the process does that you know and, and maybe that's a good thing if we've got a worker shortage i don't know i'm gonna like be a little controversial there but um you know is is there an argument that ai is making people redundant or is it is it changing the way that we work anyone want to start that one <laughs> I, can, I can give my um, my practical i think i think there's always a need for people uh i think you know, we, we're already looking now at visual API so that we can have cameras sensing what's happening on the shop floor of the warehouse, right? Yes. If you have AGVs, automated uh, uh, systems that do all the, all the handling on the on the shop floor, of course, there's a less need for, let's say, blue-collar worker in that kind of ecosystem. 
Um, but I think there's also an, a, a, a side story to that to say less and less people want to take those jobs, right? Just look at at at, at the truck drivers. Less and less people are willing to take those those jobs. So I think the 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 uh, the ability to oh sorry we have to kind of like accept that uh, 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 autonomous vehicles, uh, self-driving uh, trucks, self-driving vehicles will will come and it will it will be a need because we just don't have the people to want that want to do those jobs. And also on the on the warehouse floor, um, you you want to have it as automated as possible. Number one, because it's much more efficient, and also because it's starting to get very very difficult to get people. Really really mm -hmm. difficult. So so it is addressing like labor shortages and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 yeah fair enough. Um, Milan, did you have anything to add? To that? <laughs> yeah. <see> you. <laughs> conversation of everyday conversation. I I would like to. Uh, take a different perspective on this uh, on this question because it is such a common question uh, what I would like to ask you is imagine that in pre-industrialization pre-industrialized era you run a business making nails right yeah, every day melting it into a wire hammering it to a point now imagine running the same business of handcrafted, huh? custom-made nails today. So the question really is not, uh, so the question that uh, really is not that the that humans are becoming redundant by the advance of inter industrialization or technology, but the question that management of every company should be asking is whether we can afford not to adopt these technologies. So it is not so much about uh, what impact it has on our workforce, but much more from a business decision perspective, what become, what is the future of the business with and without this, these technologies, without AI? Yeah, so it's, it's, if, if you're competing against a business that, that doesn't adopt this this AI or, or, or doesn't adopt these decision making capabilities, then you know they will obviously be able to to move and be more agile and, and and the rest of it, and you effectively won't have a business making nails or otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, handcrafted Definitely. nails for fifty dollars each. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think uh, there was this very nice uh, joke about uh, two people talking in the in the boardroom saying, "Are you are you worried about increasing AI?" And uh, he goes, "No, I'm not worried about." Increase in AI, but I'm actually worried about decreasing the decreasing the real intelligence. He says, and I, that that sums it all. Actually, uh, uh, honestly speaking, I, I quite agree with uh, 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 what uh, you know what the comments came. Uh, there will obviously be the shift in the skill set, which obviously happens with every revolution. You cannot. There's no choice. Yeah, I mean that's 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 the way all the other. Uh, past revolutions have happened. So you need to be prepared for that. No questions about it. I mean, we need to look at it purely from a, how will this technology help humans? So in my view, I, I mean, we spoke, this obviously helps humans to be more cognitive. Yeah? It improves your cognitive skills. So we should probably put them in a more complementary position, right? Rather than a, a position which is more you know, attacking you. I don't think that's the way, uh, you know, it should be seen, right? I'm sure, uh, easier said than done but i'm just saying the way 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 to look at it would be more put them in in the context that it improves your cognitive skills and humans will be needed right you you have new skills coming in you will probably need a lot of decision making uh uh providing ethics uh, and empathy uh, you know setting up the governance these kind of roles will be needed uh, and that will of course become a little bit more uh prominent as we speak so for sure it's uh, there's no there's no uh, how do i say this worry but it's just that you know it will probably go through the usual uh you know shifting of the skill set is what we feel yeah absolutely um sundar any thoughts okay sure i compare with other speakers very diplomatic very very nicely put the point <laughs> i blindly say that there will be impact that's my point there will be impact yeah. you like yeah. it or not there will be impact because a very simple human mentality the bigger challenge is art accepting the change is a more difficult thing easy to understand during the COVID breakdown lockdown all this happened the food company who adapt to the delivery platform like a grab or food panda still able to sell food same food 
But the company say, I'm not good in digital. I don't want to adapt. Even though your food is so good, uh, you cannot sell it because of change in the situation. Um, the speed, of course, this, this much speed, maybe anybody can adapt, may be difficult, but in a look in a, in a slightly lesser speed in uh, our industry, supply chain logistics, the company already investing a lot of money. Even the third party logistics I seen in my network, a lot of companies investing even the uh, manless delivery. Mm -hmm. Why they investing? Because they know that like somebody mentioned earlier, you may not get uh, blue color work in the future. People, even you want to give the job, the people don't want to do that kind of job maybe in the future. So company need to be ready for that. Similar example I can think about in the olden days, if you want to take some aerial pictures, somebody need to drive the helicopter, somebody cameraman go with them and take now, we use the drones. Two percent job disappeared, but again one new per new job created, drone operator. <laughs> so that's the way we should take it. I mean, there will be a change, there will be a change inevitable, and we need to adapt to that. And moreover, one positive side in this change, people somebody mentioned like they want to be more cognitive, more knowledge-based work rather than a blue-collar job. That also human in human interest, at least human willingness to do that, whether we are losing intelligence, somebody mentioned like that, we don't know. But at least that's the willingness. People don't want to do more blue color work and given a choice, correct? In that aspect also is a positive. However, people say, I don't want to change anything. I follow every day SNOP one step number one to 20. Every two, all 10 to years I do like that. Sorry, you are in a, we're going to be very struggling. Yeah. And, and even getting a, some people nowadays job, even I talk to my young generation who are coming up, generation Y, etc. They don't even like this nine to five job. They prefer very ad hoc basis job. Just imagine how much change is happening. Same applies to technology also. Definitely there'll be an impact. People who adapt to that change will be survived. Hmm. That's my very ruthless answer maybe. No, but I, 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 think, I think you're right. If, if, if we are willing to adapt and, um, you know, uh, one of the things that I'm hearing from is, is, you know, rather than have somebody doing that data entry, you know, we're able to scale our operations, but then we need more people to be able to um, expedite orders or, you know, troubleshoot or, you know, do those cognitive skills that, that people are better at, right? Again, rather than, than looking at, you know, just doing those simple activities. And it may get to a point where we, we do have recommendations from the system to help facilitate that again, but again, it's going to help with scale, right? So I, I think there are opportunities, but I'm hearing very strongly that we're going to have to adapt. Now, and as you, you've raised a point earlier about, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in our earlier discussions about the education system, um, did you have any thoughts about how that will support, that will be required to support this? So, so the, I think the educational system needs to prepare people from a different angle because on one side, I mean, we spoke about it earlier, right? We, we go on a journey in a, in a company, we want to do this transformation and, and you, you take on a job that from the onset is incredibly active, very, very agile, and you, you learn a lot very fast. But once the gray day starts and everything, everything becomes normal, argument is how, how do you keep those people still in, 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 enrolled and staying into these, these roles, right? Um, I mean, I've for two decades now been working on uh, bringing on what we call super users, and, and they became the, the, the engineer on the solution, but they also became the operator moving forward. So I think when you when you're adopting technology, it, it really doesn't matter what it is. But I think specifically when it comes to uh, machine learning, uh, the ability to have people that understand the actual practical use case, and not only as an as an initiator, because you know you can hire a, per, a company or a consultant, they will come and they will do the trick. But there will be a day when they walk out, and then somebody needs to understand what's going on. And, and all of these things are, it's a constant learning. So you need to you need to have an educational system that brings in people with the onset of, well, this is gonna be your 10, 10 year role potentially. How do you prepare people for that mindset that uh, um, whilst we're changing uh, how we operate, uh, uh, how do we accelerate? And this is the, 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 the thing that organizations somehow tend to fail on. They look at it as a capital investment. I just need to do this project and then it's gonna, I, I paid it and now I'm going to have all the benefits moving forward. That is not really the case. It's, it's of course true, but if you don't adopt people that can actually take it and really scale and, and drive and adopt as changes happens, uh, I don't think that uh, we will be uh, successful. So the educational system needs to need to really work on that and prepare people into, into those kind of uh, mindsets. 
Yeah, and I, I think that's a really strong message that we heard yesterday at, um, in in the physical event as well. Is like um, I think uh, Scott from Echo Shoes was saying that if you are not coming here prepared to look at the data, be curious about the data, you know, be a, be an analyst of, of some description, then you probably don't have a position in our in our supply chain organization sure. in the future, right? And I and I think that that is a something that is becoming a, a real reality, right? Um, so yeah, but certainly a point to, 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 and we have one minute left. So I'm going to ask you all in, in, you know, one sentence, two sentences in terms of guidance for companies looking at AI and, and Bob has mentioned that since machine learning is a subset of AI, perhaps we should stop using the, the phrase AI and machine learning and just call it AI. So I'm going to call it AI. Um, uh, you know, with regards to AI, what would, what would be, a, you know, the next action that you would encourage companies to take if they're, they're looking at embarking on this journey? Let's start with Sunda. Just openness, willing to change. Be open and be willing to change. Great advice. Yeah. Anders? Uh, I, I think having having the the, 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 this, this, the belief that you can do it and, and you will be able to do it. Yeah. Good call. Kamish? Uh, yeah, no choice. We have to do it. Uh, so, yeah, embrace it and enjoy the journey. True. Yeah, absolutely. And Milind? Uh, what I would say is start. Start small, but start uh, as soon as possible. Yeah. Great advice. All right. Well, uh, thank you to my panel. Thank you, Anand, Anders, Kamish, and Milind for, for joining me. I do appreciate the time that you've invested. Thank you to the audience for, for you know tuning in and uh, for the, the comments and questions that we had. And uh, I'll pass it on to Joe to uh, take us to the next segment. Thanks very much, Stephanie, Thank and thanks to all the panelists for your excellent contributions. It was really good discussion, very sound advice, and very uh, profound thinking for us to go through for the next uh, few months or so. Again, all the very best to all of you, and thanks again for your participation. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>